Uh, welcome to the Natural Language Processing course. Uh, today we're going to continue with uh, one of the most interesting topics in natural language processing, namely parsing. Uh, I want to remind you that last time we looked at uh, parsing already and uh, I wanted to bring up that uh, parsing human languages is very different from parsing programming languages. So when we parse a programming language, uh, we have to parse uh, statements and uh, punctuation and variables. However, all of those are designed to be unambiguous. So for example, this uh, C program here can only be interpreted in one possible way. There's a main function, and then inside the main function, there's some variable declarations and a while loop, and each of those gets converted into binary code in a very unambiguous way. Parsing human language, on the other hand, is uh, very different. I will give you some examples to show you why it can be a challenge. The first uh, problem is coordination scope. Uh, look at the sentence, small boys and girls are playing. This sentence can have two different interpretations. The adjective small can attach to either boys, in which case we have boys who are small and girls who are or are not small, both of those are playing. And the alternative interpretation is that both boys and girls are small and they are both playing. The second example is what is known as prepositional phrase attachment. Uh, prepositional phrase is a phrase that starts with a preposition, as the name suggests. So in the sentence, I saw the man with the telescope, with the telescope is a prepositional phrase because it starts with a preposition with. Now let's try to interpret the sentence. One interpretation is that the man that I saw was carrying a telescope. And another interpretation is that I saw the man using my telescope. As you can see, those are two very different interpretations and it is difficult, in fact, impossible to tell which one was intended here. The third example is about gaps. Uh, sometimes a sentence may skip some words uh, if they can be understood from the context and the sentence can still make sense, but it may be very difficult to process computationally. Look at the example. Mary likes physics but hates chemistry. If we want to find out who likes physics, the sentence tells us right away, it's Mary. But who hates chemistry? Well, it's still Mary, but uh, the sentence doesn't say this implicitly. We have to infer uh, the subject of hates chemistry from the structure of the sentence. The fourth example is about the use of some words as either particles or prepositions. In English, the word up can be a particle, as in to run up, for example, to run up a bill, in which case up modifies ran, or it can also be the beginning of a prepositional phrase, like up a large bill. Obviously, up a large bill is not a valid prepositional phrase, but you can have another sentence that is, she ran up a large hill, in which case up a large hill is a prepositional phrase. And how do we know that this is a different interpretation? Well, it's very easy. We can move up a large bill to the beginning of the sentence. We can say up a large hill, she ran. But we cannot say up a large bill, she ran. So the example with hill, we have uh, up as a preposition, and in the example with bill, up is a particle. And the fifth example for now is the difference between uh, gerunds and adjectives. ing words in English can be either gerunds, which is uh, verbal forms, or they can be used as adjectives. So in the example here, we have one interpretation. Playing cards can be expensive, as in to play cards can be expensive because you lose money when you play cards. At the same time, another interpretation could be that playing cards, as in a specific type of cards, what kind of cards, playing cards, can be expensive. So in parsing, uh, sentences can be represented using a phrase structure formalism. This is a very simple example here. We have uh, Buster chased a cat. Buster is a proper noun, uh, which is uh, labeled with NNP in uh, our tag set. Chased is a verb. The D at the end of verb stands for past tense, as in chased, ED. A is a determiner, and cat is a common noun, which uh, is labeled with NN in our grammar. Now we can start combining those words into phrases. A cat is a noun phrase that consists of a determiner and a noun. Chased a cat is a verb phrase that consists of a verb, chased, and the noun phrase, a cat. And then at the top level, we have a noun phrase, buster, combined with a verb phrase, chased a cat, to form a sentence, s. 
Okay, so now we're going to look into two specific uh, problems in parsing uh, in more detail. The first problem is what we call parsing noun sequences. In English, very often a noun can modify another noun. An example of this is fish tank. What is a fish tank? Well, a fish tank is a kind of tank, specifically a kind of tank that holds fish. Let's look now at a very similar construction that has a very different interpretation. What is a fish net? A fish net is a net that is used to catch fish. What is fish soup? Fish soup is soup made with fish. What is fish oil? Oil extracted from fish. As you can see, even though the four noun phrases have a very similar uh, structure, superficially, they have very different interpretations. Some of those can even be ambiguous. Uh, fish sauce. What is fish sauce? Is it a sauce for fish dishes, or is it sauce made of fish? It could be either one. In English, when we have a noun-noun compound, most of the time, the head of the compound is uh, the second word in the pair. So for example, college junior and junior college look very similar. They have the same words. However, a college junior is a kind of junior, specifically one who goes to college rather than high school. Whereas a junior college is a kind of college as opposed to, let's say, a senior college or a graduate college. Well, I said that in English, typically the head of a two-word noun phrase is the second noun, but we have exceptions. The head first rule can also appear sometimes. So an attorney general is an exception. It's not a kind of general, it's rather a kind of attorney. But again, those kind of phrases are relatively rare in English. Now, what about adjectives? In some cases, uh, words like college and college junior uh, can be considered as adjectives because they modify the second noun. In other cases, we have explicit adjectives as part of the noun phrase. For example, New Mexico, new is clearly an adjective, and general manager, the word general is an adjective rather than a noun. It turns out that in English, people don't always agree. So when they ask to label general manager, they often say that it's an adjective followed by a noun, but just as often they say that it's two nouns. Now, noun phrases consisting of nouns are not limited to two nouns. Look at the example on the bottom of the page. Uh, what is a luxury car dealership? Well, there are two possible interpretations, at least two, that it's a dealership for luxury cars or it's a car dealership that is very luxurious. Now, the interpretations of this noun phrase can be connected to the structure of the phrase. So let's look at an example. Detroit Tigers is clearly a noun phrase that consists of two nouns. However, if we look at Detroit Tigers general manager, we know that it really consists of two noun phrases, Detroit Tigers followed by general manager, which are combined into a noun phrase themselves. However, with four consecutive nouns, we can have many other interpretations. Let's see first what happens with three words. Salt Lake City has three words. We can either combine first salt and lake, and the interpretation in that case would be a city that is at Salt Lake, or we can have a city that's called Lake City and somehow use the word salt to modify. Now, in this case, it's pretty obvious that it's the first interpretation that matters. The second one is spurious and nobody would ever think about it. Now, what happens with four uh, words? Can you think of the way that we should put parentheses around those four words so that we get the only reasonable interpretation of the sentence? The answer is on the next slide. Okay, so I asked you a question about the interpretation of Salt Lake City Mayor, and obviously the solution is the one that you can see here. Salt and Lake are combined first, then Salt Lake is combined with City, that gives us the kind of city that we want. And finally, Salt Lake City Mayor is the mayor of Salt Lake City. So this representation using parentheses is very common in natural language processing. Uh, it allows us uh, to write uh, very compact representations of sentences and phrases. We don't need to have to recur to uh, phrase structure uh, diagrams. Let's look at the second example here, Detroit Tigers general manager. As you can see now, we're putting the parentheses in a different location. We first want to group together Detroit and Tigers, and then general and manager, and finally combine the two pairs into one. Now the next, actually, is a mistake. It should be Leland Stanford Junior University 
So the question here to the students is, um, if you have a phrase like Leland Stanford Junior University, which by the way is the official title of this university on the West Coast, uh, there are two possible interpretations, one of which is pretty obvious, but wrong, and the second one is less obvious, but correct. So what are those? Well, you will see the answer on the next slide. Okay, so um, the question was, Leland Stanford Junior University, what are the two possible interpretations? Well, one of them is that Leland Stanford is a person. Leland Stanford Jr. is the son of Leland Stanford Sr., apparently. And then finally, the university is named after Leland Stanford Jr. Now let's do a little bit of combinatorics. We notice that if the noun phrase consists of two nouns, uh, then we only have one possible interpretation, and that is A and B are combined together. This is the case of the toy tiger. There's only one way to combine the two. Now, if we have three nouns, then there are two possible interpretations. Uh, a connects to B first, and then the group of A and B connects to C. Or alternatively, we can combine B and C together and then group them together with A. Now my question to you is, if we have four nouns, how many different interpretations are there? So one of them is shown here. It's A, B connected, C and D connected, and both of them connected to each other, just like in Detroit Tigers. Can you think of the total number of ways to combine four nouns? And the answer is on the next slide. Well, it turns out that with four nouns, you can have five different interpretations. This is not a very obvious answer. Most people say either four or six, and only when they look at those five do they realize that the correct answer is five. So what we can do is do the Detroit Tigers general manager example. That's the one shown on the first line. We can also group the last two words, then add the second one, then the first one, and so on. You can see that there are really five different ways to group four nouns. Okay, now the question to you is, what happens if we have more than four nouns? Here's an example with five. We group A and B first, and then we group C and D, then we add E to the cluster CD, and we finally group the two smaller clusters into a, a list of five nouns. So my question to you is, how many different groupings of five consecutive nouns there are? Well, the answer is on the next slide. Well, it turns out that the solution is known as the nth Catalan number. A Catalan here is not a reference to the Catalan language. It's rather a reference to a Belgian mathematician whose last name was Catalan. The closed form solution here is C, a subscript N, is uh, one divided by N plus one times to n, choose n, for any n greater or equal to zero. So the first few Catalan numbers are shown here. Uh, it's one and two. That's for the cases where n is equal to zero and one. And then when n is equal to three, we have two combinations. Then for n equals four, we have five combinations, as you saw earlier. And then the numbers increase rather fast, 14, 42, 132, and so on. Note that those are not powers of two. Those are not factorials. It's a completely different sequence. The sequence is commonly known by its index in the online encyclopedia of integer sequences under A108. And you can uh, visit the URL below on your own and investigate uh, this sequence and others in more detail. It turns out that Catalan numbers appear very often in math in many different locations. In addition to parses of uh, sequences of words, they appear in two other very interesting geometrical cases. The one on the left is the number of different ways in which a convex polygon with n plus two sides can be cut into triangles by connecting vertices with straight lines. And you can see that there are 14 different ways to do this when n plus two is equal to six. So in our case, that's n equals four. An example on the right is the number of monotonic paths along the edges of a grid that consists of n by n square cells. And the constraint is that the paths should not pass above the diagonal. So the first example here is one where you go east, 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 and then north, 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 and north. The second one is east, 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 north, east, north, north, north. You get the idea. Uh, as you can see, there are 14 ways to get from the bottom left corner to the top right corner using this uh, set of constraints. 
So you see that Catalan numbers are very versatile and appear in many different places, not just in natural language parsing. So this concludes the section on uh, parsing noun phrase sequences. The next uh, set of slides will be about prepositional phrase attachment.